Welcome back, everybody. Um, it's actually it's very nice to be in the Thomas Telford Lecture Theatre here. For those of you who don't know Thomas Telford, just by the way, um, uh, in a sense, he was the person who started the Industrial Revolution because he built um, the first iron bridge, which is uh, just uh, about 15 miles west of Stoke and 30 miles south of Manchester, which is where the Industrial Revolution really started. I think it's, if you were to put uh, an official start date for the start of the Industrial Revolution, it would be Telford's Bridge. Just That's just by the way. Anyway, um, I just thought I'd um, start by um, saying just a couple of words. One of the things that, that I wanted to, as there's some funders here, I thought I'd take this opportunity to say, you know, we find one of the things you heard was it's sometimes important to re-genotype samples that have been genotyped already. And uh, I think that is indeed important, but try saying that to a grant funding agency. They look back and they say, didn't you do this? And you can't say we didn't do it very well. That's not a satisfactory answer to grant funding agencies. And a lot of grant funding agencies also don't almost, uh, as their triage process, say we don't fund GWAS. That's part of their triage process. And uh, that also is, I mean, that also is not appropriate. I mean, if you're finding new genes, then that's, it's just not an appropriate response in my uh, humble view. So, although you might have thought I was a little bit antagonistic towards the um, idea of uh, more genetic analysis, we do definitely need it. Anyway, that's all, that's all just uh, ex-cathedra statements from me. So, um, this, the goal of this session is to talk about variant interpretation, how to uh, move from uh, move these fi the findings that we're making uh, to the clinic, and I think that's a very difficult uh, process with many uh, hurdles. And so I'm very pleased that we've got the panel we have. Starting on the right hand side, John Rora. John's a clinician at the Institute of Neurology, and he is, um, he, he is head of the GenFi program. The GenFi program is the largest uh, and first uh, genetic of FTD uh, collaborative analyses. Uh, it's uh, centered in Europe, and John is the PI of that study. And of course, FTD is a complicated disease because there's many disorders, so it's good to have his perspective. Julie Williams needs no introduction, um, and you can take that however you, you like. <laughs> But let me say that Julie and I have worked together on uh, Alzheimer's disease since the dark days of uh, the early 1990s, and she's headed the uh, GWAS program here in the UK, and uh, Dr. Ann Bassett from uh, Toronto, who I last met at a chromosome 14 uh, program meeting in 1993 when we were all chasing the presenilin gene, uh, and uh, she uh, is an expert in clinical uh, genetics. So a very good panel to discuss this. So I've been given a series of questions. Uh, perhaps I should start uh, by uh, this. Oh, I've got last session's questions. Sorry, I should look at my own. Is, ge is genetic screening better at prediction of disease than the current tra traditional phenotypic methods? I think I'll start with Julie on this one. Okay. Well, if, if you look at the data, um, looking at clinical or even research um, uh, diagnosis, uh, and you compare it to neuropath uh, gold standard, um, evidence suggests that that you get it right over 90% of the time. If you look at um, the current GWAS data, and Valentina has done a lot of work uh, here on, on looking at polygenic score, and looking at risk, amalgamating the risk for, for Alzheimer's from these common variants. 
uh, evidence uh, shows that these polygenic risk uh, analyses get it right about 84% of the time. So taking the literal uh, sense of this question, the clinical diagnosis is better for the diagnosis of, of the disease. However, what the diagnosis cannot do is help you predict those that are going to develop Alzheimer's disease. And I think this is where the genetic uh, methods really come into their own, because you can identify a polygenic score uh, and uh, you can look at individuals at any age, in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s. Uh, and that is their genetic risk of developing, you know, it remains the same. So, so you can identify potentially people that are going on to develop Alzheimer's or in the very early stages of Alzheimer's disease. And we know uh, now from, from recent uh, findings that um, Alzheimer's occurs uh, about 10 to 15 years before you get any cognitive uh, <laughs> symptoms at all. So, so that is a very important component uh, and, uh, uh, of genetics uh, and something that I think um, hopefully will be used more by drug companies. One of the things that has most disappointed me, I have to say, is that uh, in clinical trials and clinical trials that are trying to, to do early work, um, very few drug companies use all that information that is out there about uh, risk prediction from the genetics, which is getting really good now. Uh, at best, uh, drug companies use APOE. Well, uh, the information that we now have is significantly better than APOE alone, uh, and uh, I hope that others, as well as drug companies, use this information. So for, for diagnosis, probably the clinical diagnosis is, is probably a better but for uh, predicting those that are in the early stages of disease, genetics, I think, are better. And as a clinical geneticist, what do you think of this, uh, this issue? Well, I'll just start by introducing myself because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a dementia person at all. Um, my background is in schizophrenia genetics, and my subspecialty area is in copy number variation. So uh, I work uh, primarily with a condition called 22Q11.2 deletion uh, syndrome, where there is an association with early onset Parkinson's disease. So that's my only entree into neurodegenerative disorders. Otherwise, it's congenital cardiac disease, developmental disorders, and, and schizophrenia, So, which is also a neurodevelopmental uh, disorder with some degeneration. So I'll just give that background. So I'm very used to uh, being in a, a field where there, there is diagnosis, not, a, a not, of course, a neuropath diagnosis, so a clinical diagnosis for schizophrenia, for example, um, uh, and where we have now some ability to do some genetic testing. But that's really at the level of, of uh, uh, for certain subtypes of schizophrenia. So there's about 5% of, 3 to 5% of schizophrenia where you could have an actual genetic, make a molecular genetic diagnosis uh, where you're pretty sure where the, where the person has a copy number variation, say 22Q1.2 deletion, that, uh, that's associated with an, an actual diagnosis of schizophrenia, that that, will be, that would be considered basically causal for that form of the schizophrenia. But for prediction, um, I completely agree with, uh, with Julie. Uh, even if you're born with a 22Q1.2 deletion, you have a one in four chance of developing schizophrenia. So the odds ratio is quite high. It's good. It's about 20. So that's good. Um, uh, but of course, three out of four people born with, uh, with that uh, genetic abnormality do not go on to develop schizophrenia. And I think this is much more the norm for clinical genetics and certainly for complex, uh, for complex disease. We have great polygenic risk scores for schizophrenia. They're completely useless with respect to the clinic uh, at this, certainly at this time. So for was, in schizophrenia. So I was going to in fact ask you, and you, I guess that was the answer, would you ever use this type of information to influence your view about the diagnosis? And if not, can you ever see a time when you might? For the major 
genetic changes that are right now are all copy number variation uh, mutations that are associated with schizophrenia, that changes your management, changes genetic counseling, clearly. Um, it changes your management in, in terms of your view of the patient. It certainly changes things wholeheartedly for the patient and the family. Um, it doesn't change the treatment uh, with respect to antipsychotic choice. It does change it a bit, but I won't go into that right now unless somebody has a question about it. Um, uh, but it's not, they're not, uh, we're not using this for genetic screening per se, even within schizophrenia. One could argue that we might be moving towards that. It's certainly, it should be used, uh, at least microarray should be used for anyone with a developmental disability. Just to, to follow up on that, do you, I, you might have said this, but do you feed that information, or let's say about the uh, DeGeorge deletion, do you feed that information back to the clinician or the patient's family? Oh, good grief, it's a clinical test. Yes, it's a clear, approved lab clinical test. Yes. Uh, of course, for DeGeorge syndrome, but uh, uh, I, did, I mean... I, and and for if, if we're doing, yes, so that's an excellent, that's actually an excellent question, John. So, so in, in, uh, in our research, if we, which we have certainly done, um, if we find a major clinical, uh, clinically pathogenic copy number variation, then absolutely we would then, on a research basis, then we would go back to the family, take another blood sample, run it through a clinically approved uh, lab, and uh, pr provide the family with uh, genetic counselling. Yeah, I think that we would do the same, and I think that's what the uh, Irish talk also essentially said as well. So I think that there's a consistency about that type of information. John, FTD is really a complicated, I'm going to say mess, but I don't mean that. It is mess, yeah. Um, I, I, just taking a step back, I suppose um, mm. there are some interesting things about how you use them in a diagnosis. And I think the, the first panel um, this morning was interesting. If I think about, uh, so I do a weekly specialist dementia clinic. Um, actually, lots of people sat in front of me have a not clear syndrome. Mm -hmm. So um, not everybody has very clear amnestic Alzheimer's disease or very clear behavioral variants in frontal temporal dementia. There are lots of people I see that have a bit of memory impairment, a bit of behavioral problems. And actually lots of our, when we think about the samples we collect and that go into studies, uh, actually the, the samples that I'm donating in from my clinic, uh, I'm taking samples really from pure Alzheimer's disease and pure FTD. And so a lot of the studies that we've we look at contain these very pure cases, but actually when you have these slightly more difficult cases in front of you and you're thinking about mm. what I'm going to do with these people, they're substantially harder. And I think those trying to think about how we use uh, you know, genetics for those is, is definitely harder. On a very simplistic basis, thinking about um, how we make a diagnosis rather than prediction in those people, I've spent the last 15 years thinking about how to improve genotype-phenotype correlations. I've published lots on how we might predict who's got X gene problem. Mm -hmm. And I've spent a lot of time with our geneticists, geneticists saying, actually, you know, in the end, we're going to screen everybody for everything. Now, um, time has moved from where I would be charged 500 pounds for one gene to uh, a time when I can do a panel on, on different people. But I, I think those are, uh, you know, that has changed things a lot. But it does require still some nature of, of knowing what that phenotype is. It's very clear that um, if I take, for instance, just c 9 72 actually relatively common um, genetic problem. And those patients have a whole variety of phenotypes. They're sometimes a bit memory-led. They're sometimes a bit AD-like. They are sometimes a bit FTD-like. And so, actually, it's, um, you know, I think the one has to take into account both a bit of phenotype and also um, a bit of wider genetic screening in those, in those people. So I think trying to solve, think about how... Um, one deals with the dirtiness of a, a normal clinic, and gene panels are helpful in those. But we'll come on to thinking a bit about sort of the interpretation of those. Um, so, yeah, I think um, that's sort of um, diagnosis of things. 
When you think about um, prediction, I, I think one of the key things is about how we um, think about timing of onset, because actually that's the big question when we think about um, uh, we have a polygenic risk score or even just even a, a simple um, a single gene disorder. Actually, what lots of people want to know is when am I, it's great that you tell me my risk, but when am I going to actually get the disease? And, that, and that's, I think, we're a long way to go in terms of thinking about that. And of course, with C9 or 72, as you kind of implied, you know, you might find somebody has a, a variant, but you don't know whether they're going to get FTD or motor neuron disease, for example. Yeah, or even get the disease. I mean, yeah. you know, we have, um, uh, you know, we've people who've come to post-mortem who have um, no symptoms um, in, the, in their 70s and 80s and very clearly have a C9 off um, expansion. So I think that is difficult. I find that very difficult. I see lots, of, um, lots and lots of families um, and um, I, I still don't quite know what to say to lots of families about what their risk is and what that risk means for them in terms of, of developing symptoms. So I, I think you know, there is going to be a, um, a, a sort of question over what, when one gets to the ultimate point. Are we going to have enough genetic modifiers plus you know, uh, uh, information about the phenotype that eventually we will provide a perfect answer to that. But I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that that's what we need to do. It, it, it certainly, from my point of view, very. Um, I find it very difficult, both in clinic with people who have symptoms and also with um, uh, uh, family members, to think about how I adequately talk about that risk with people. So I, one of, I mean, one of the things following from what you said is, of course, we, we started by thinking LERC2 mutations were fully penetrant or fairly fully penetrant based upon the original studies. And now we have penetrance estimates which vary from 80 to 90 percent to 20 to 20 to 30 percent. So very, very different outcomes, maybe in different populations or maybe in different study designs. So this is obviously something which is very difficult. Julie. Uh, another um, um element to consider, and, and I think Jerry mentioned this, is you know, why do we um, tell people if they're at risk unless we can use that information? Now, now you've pointed out that you, maybe you can to define you know, awkward diagnoses, and, and, and that's useful. But I think we need to now uh, consider that we may be at the stage um, for uh, prediction of common Alzheimer's disease, say in your 40s and 50s, uh, where we can identify people perhaps at the extreme high risk, and, and we know that we get that right over 90% of the time, that maybe we can um, help them prevent or delay the disease by what we know from epidemiology, for example. There's a lot of evidence that uh, uh, you know, lifestyle exercise is probably the, one of the most important things, but also controlling uh, your vascular health through treating blood pressure, diabetes, etc. So, so uh, I think there, within the health service, there is now a conversation going on, certainly in Wales, uh, about whether we're at the stage that we could uh, use that information earlier uh, to try and prevent and, and uh, uh, delay uh, the disease, even though we don't have uh, specific treatments uh, in the pipeline uh, at the moment. Well, as somebody said in the last in the last session, I can't remember who, of course, and to some extent, I think it was Cornelia, to some extent this is a circular argument because we want to enrol people in clinical trials early. So to do that, we, ha we either have to implicitly let them know that they're at high risk and or somehow disguise that through the way we design the trials. Hmm. I, it, it's a question for debate about you know, should people know? Um, uh, people get their, you know, genotypes from 23andMe and, you know, there is a, uh, there are always people who say, where can I get my, you know, 
uh, genes tested in, in, in when you go and talk about these things. So there is an appetite out there to know, but I think it has to be done in in a uh, a clinical setting with with backup, uh, you know, with a gene therapy backup. Uh, but it, it, we are, I think we are at that stage to have this conversation because what we know from genetics could be of use, even common genetics for people with Alzheimer's, uh, I'm specifically talking about, uh, already. So, uh, yeah, so, so I think we're there. So it's one of the key questions is thinking about how you, uh, I mean, this is all about adoption and how we move to, to taking these into the clinic, is do we have enough expertise Mm. To, to, to do those things. I mean, who's going to do it? Um, it's not like the clinical geneticists don't have a busy enough clinic and a long enough waiting list. Yeah. Are we going to let individual specialists do it? I mean, I think it's very difficult. And, and you know, I've definitely um, been on the wrong side of a, a discussion. There is a movement, I think particularly in the UK, not to over-diagnose dementia, whatever that means. And, and if you sit and read only a few copies of the British Medical Journal, there's usually a, a anti trying to make earlier diagnoses in dementia. So I think we'd have a lot of, you know, we are probably of a certain view, but, but persuading the general population in the UK that what we need is a early onset predictive dementia clinic would be tough. Yeah, I'm not saying I have the answers, but no, I think but we're at the stage where we can have that conversation. And I, 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 I'll go, don't worry, I'll, I promise I'll go to the audience, but I, I, I'm a bit of a libertarian myself, and, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, what do you think as a, as a clinical geneticist about people going to 23andMe? Uh, there's been a couple of horror stories here in the UK of people who wanted to see if they had Hungarian ancestry and found, found out they're E4 homozygotes, uh, and then, you know, that's been devastating to them. What do you think about that sort of, sort of, uh, of that, that's, that sort of uh, you know, off the shelf, if you like, outside the system diagnostic practice? Well... We won't call it diagnostic practice, I think. But uh, um, I, I think without the genetic counseling, without knowledgeable genetic counseling, I, I, I think we're, we're really in a pickle. Uh, whether it's 23andMe, I mean, that was one of the reasons it was stopped years ago in the States, but it's, you know, it's obviously it's a free for all again now. Um, and because of the link up with whatever Facebook, Google, it'll all, it's all going to be one big corporate thing um, in the cloud eventually, I would think, because they'll soon go to whole genome sequencing. I wouldn't be at all surprised, I mean, once the, once the price comes down. So, um, because it's a great business. It's a really great business. And people love it. It's recreational. But it, they don't all understand that it's recreational. It's certainly not diagnostic, and it's not screening either. And if there's no genetic counseling associated, I think it's very dangerous. And I think that the two, it's, it's, uh, it's really important to hear the um, the, both, not, not reticence, I would say, but the caution, uh, I, I would say, be, because these are very messy conditions. Um, they're messy diagnostically, they're messy phenotypically, the variable expression is still unknown, I would, I would warrant, um, for, neuro, for common complex disorders as a, as a whole. Um, uh, and certainly the penetrance is is uh, even for things where you thought you might have known, that's the first set of studies. Ascertainment is everything in all, in all research, right? So, so you can really shift things, and, it, and you'll see that probably even within the GWAS, that the first group of uh, studies, the first group of, uh, uh, or genomes that you're looking at, you know, the results might be a bit different from the next series. That, uh, that comes in probably because of how they're ascertained in the, you know, in the individual clinics that, are, that form part of the consortium. But I think without the genetic counseling, you can't, and, and the knowledge behind it to interpret the findings, it's no good. Yeah, we're going to talk about pathogenicity next, but let's open it for questions. At Arts Forum, we've written quite a bit about polygenic risk scores and going to conferences and talking to senior scientists at different pharma companies, they're very interested in it. 
And I think a specific application that they're starting to consider is for these early stage trials mm -hmm. for prodromal. Those are done, and then the much bigger, big ones are ramping up now for pre-symptomatic, the late pre-symptomatic stages of the preclinical 20-year phase. I think they're having terrible trouble um, uh, recruiting, and the biggest problem of the prodromal trials has been uh, the massive screen failure rate. So they bring thousands of people in for PET scans. Each PET scan is costs thousands of several thousand dollars, and then you know, some 80% um, of them fail, or at least 50% fail the PET scan after they've been cognitively screened. So I think there is a great specific need for a cheaper, simpler, simpler less invasive test to indicate whether somebody has brain amyloid and then can be staged for when they'll become symptomatic. And I think the question that I'm hearing is that uh, people would like to see how um, a polygenic risk score would compare um, to a blood test, because after 20 years of trying and failing, it looks as now, suddenly, various groups are having good success with um, blood tests for A beta and also tau. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there a way to evaluate that? And because then I think, uh, at least for the large trials, the, can, the, poly, uh, the, the PRS could really go somewhere soon. I mean, there's, I would commend everybody to try if they've got the, uh, the methods there to, to, to try and validate in, in, in other samples. We know that uh, in, in terms of neuropath, uh, you know, you, uh, the, the polygenic risk score will get it right to 84% of the time. So at the end stage, so working back, uh, one would anticipate that these, uh, this information would be useful, but why use one or the other? I mean, a simple blood test plus, you know, uh, a 50 pound um, you know uh, chip is 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 small beer really uh, and doing those things together I think you're going to get a lot more useful information uh, and uh, th there is work on uh, looking at relationships with pet scans and and scanning I don't know if Valentina's got any uh, examples but but on the evidence that we have, one would predict that uh, that information, the genetic information, is going to be useful at that phase. So looking at um, different sorts of MCI uh, and identifying and predicting those that are actually going to go on to develop dementia rather than something else. So I would, I would commend it. The problem is that the drug companies are not using it. The so, data are out there. So I, I'm curious what people think about the polygenic risk score that's determined essentially from case control data where your risk of getting disease is 50 percent versus population data of people that are 60 years old when you might want to use this and so somebody comes into their annual checkup and say what well, you know what's my risk of getting Alzheimer's and you run this polygenic risk score that's going to be a very different answer than if using data from a case control um, study so I'm a little nervous that this is being oversold and particularly then comparing it to PATH data from the same type of population rather than a population-based uh, uh, study. So I would wonder what you think about that. And I you know, have to say, getting this from a population-based study is extremely difficult because there's just so few cases and just not enough data there. Well, I, th I think that you know it has been looked at in, in in population data, but if you just look at the area under the curve, I mean, you, you for for those at the extremes, I, I think you know the evidence suggests that that would be extremely useful data. Uh, for those in you know where you have ambiguity in the middle, it it may not be enormously helpful. But I think if you choose your individuals based on a high polygenic score. Uh, and combine that with other uh, reasonable biomarkers, I think you, you will get a, a much more accurate prediction of those that genuinely are going to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. I understand what you, you're saying, but that, that um, uh, those sorts of, of data, the polygenic score can be taken into those epidemiological studies. I don't know if Cornelia wants to comment, have you looked at in, in your, your epidemiological studies? Yes, we did, and uh, we just had a paper out in Lancet Neurology showing what the, what the power is, and that was a population-based study, so Sven did that. Uh, and I, I think 
What you see from there is that the, the, the data that we can translate from the genetics to the population are pretty accurate and you can do something with that, both in terms of absolute risk of somebody, whether the risk is extremely high or extremely low. Um, what I always caution, and I just forwarded you the papers on, uh, if you have these extreme high risk, of course that's not a very large group. And actually, if you look at these extremes in risk of absolute risk that are very high, that's a rare group again. Right? But um, my argument would be, and uh, that's a question to the panel again, uh, if your risk of Alzheimer's disease is 60 or 80 percent by age 80, it doesn't matter so much whether it's, it's explained by a single gene or a combination of genes. I think for the person as such, it's the same risk. And it's a bit odd that clinically, it's considered as something completely different. And uh, I always wondered about that. Why is it so different whether you develop a disease by a certain age, whether it's uh, age 12 or age 80, by one single variant or a combination of variants for that person, it's the same information. And the quality of prediction is, is pretty high, I think, by now. I'm going to let Anne answer that. I'm going to let Anne answer that because she wanted to talk as well. But I'll just say I never understood why a Huntingdon expansion of 38 required a clinical geneticist, but APOE4 homozygotes, which is essentially the same risk. So echoing what you said was absolutely ruled out of order yeah. by clinical geneticists. And my suspicion was it was simply that they couldn't handle the clinical load. Or the clinical calculations, right? I mean, it's I, I, difficult. Something psychologically different, I think. I, I mean, I, there obviously is a psychological difference, otherwise it wouldn't be different and we would be doing different things. I think the... Of course, you know, also doing your APOE pulls out all of the other single APOE4 <laughs> carriers and not the homozygotes. And anyway, I'll let you answer that. But I think it, there is something psychologically different. And uh, you well, wanted to well, talk yeah, also Yeah, I mean, now, now, of course, there's like 15 different points, but that's, that's good. Um, um, uh, I think if, if, that's, if that's really true and you have, you have the data, to show that there's a very rare group that has a very rare kind of polygenic risk score, which is a combination of four variants. Is that what you? Or, no, multiple. Yeah, no, whatever. Thousands, tens of thousands, eighty. Okay, but it's but but a lot of it's due to a few a few variants. Is my understanding? Okay, which which is which in and of itself is already different from, uh, like the schizophrenia polygenic risk score is, is, is excellent on, again, on a population basis, just coming to Jerry's point as well, but it's not, it's, it is absolutely not useful on a clinical basis, and, and it may be because the composition, <laughs> and there aren't those, like that, that extreme, or at least the work has not been done on that extreme, to, to follow the patients to see whether or not they actually develop the illness. Okay, or what that proportion would be, which is like getting a penetrance value for that, for that uh, sort of, but then I think you're exactly right, Grinnell. It's, it's, then it becomes no different from having a single, uh, you know, re slightly reduced penetrance uh, uh, mutation. It, it's, then it, it's not the same and it is probably equal in rarity. Um, as well, so that which is which is fine, but I I think there is there is certainly a difference in terms of there's a huge difference in terms of training with respect to comfort level for uh, for clinicians. Um, in in my experience, it's extremely difficult to train uh, certainly psychiatrists. I can't speak for neurologists, but to train Impossible. to train them to. Um, uh, to understand, first of all, understand what is a copy number variation. They don't get, they don't, I mean, it may be very different in your countries, but it, it's certainly in, in America and in Canada, genetics training is modest. It's less than what I received. 
100 years ago when I trained. So it, it's, it's very, very modest. They're not comfortable. They are not comfortable in any way. They might have heard maybe the DNA is involved in a copy number variation. They have no idea that, and it's 20 years, we, 25 years, we, they should know. They should know, right? It has uh, to do with so, the, uh, well, people don't like risk. So the, the, the issue with the Huntington's is that you're doing that test with a possibility that there might be 100% certainty in a result because you might find a, a large expansion. So the fact that you might find a result that provides you with something definitive, something non-definitive, yeah. is not certainly felt. Up. The likelihood is you might find something definitive. Clinicians find something that can only possibly provide you with a risk as being substantially less comfortable and helpful. So I think that's the dip. There are, there are tests. Actually, where you... I chose the repeat length based upon the fact that that is not penetrant. Yeah, but, 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 you're, I but mean, you know what I mean? You, you've, yeah. you've, you've seen somebody, you've done the Huntington's test because you think that yeah. you might get a definitive result. You don't happen to get one. That, that, so that, that it's about how that test is seen, whereas the APOE test is seen as not providing you with a definitive answer, but only providing you with a risk, which is a, a far less comfortable position for us to be in, and a, and a non-traditional position for us to be in. You're saying that it's not, that it's different than that, that it's more certain, that, because the penetrance is higher. I just pointed out is that we just published, I can't imagine how it could be better, last week in Lancet uh, Neurology, our penetrance curves. Exactly what you want, we gave it now to the clinical geneticist in an epidemiological setting. So basically, you will have the penetrance curve now. It's, of course, we're outdated already because new genes are found. But this should help you show the patient if you are in this category. And we made graphs even, just like the framing and risk score for cardiovascular disease, right? And if you are in this setting, you will have a 10% risk by age 60 and 80% by age 85. But if you are in another category, you have a 10% risk by age 100, right? But you can also take this chart that we made and say, okay, based if you are an E44, you can still show that people have the disease six years earlier if they are in the high risk group of the uh, other variants, right? And these kind of modifications, we try to make it as easy, accessible as possible. But I think this will be the future of translation, right? We have, for the clinical geneticists, yes. we have to give penetrance curves. And you can look at them at risk. It also shifts in age of onset, which is also important because... Yeah. I hope your paper is open. I hope your paper is open access and you've paid for complete open access and people can <laughs> access it now. Yeah, no, not just me though. So, does anyone else have an urgent question before we uh, move on? I think we're all going to agree that absolutely, physician and uh, and actually population te education is absolutely desperately needed. Can I just, uh, I suppose, make one comment, which is that so we had a, a group of um, researchers across Europe who were involved in familial neurogenerative disease, AD, FTD, Huntington's, a whole, uh, all, all set of neurogenerative illnesses, and asking everybody in that room what was the percentage of people who uh, chose to find out their risk. Um, and the answer is universally is somewhere between 20 and 30% of people. And that's when we're talking about a monogenic illness, that only 20, 30% of people choose to know what the risks are. 70, 80% of people would rather not know what their risk is. And so the question when it comes down to what actually is the percentage of the population would really want to know what their risk of getting Alzheimer's disease in the next 30 years is, I suspect that might even be less. Uh, yeah, I think we should move on, and I apologise for being a lax chairman. Um, but um, uh, I, one thing that I wanted to move on uh, were to really, because it's a problem that we face and have faced a lot, and I think it's a difficult question, is how do we determine pathogenicity? How do we, de I mean, how do we determine pathogenicity in a clinical session, in a clinical setting? 
John, do you want to start with this? Um, I, I think that's tough. I mean, so we've moved recently um, from seeing people and doing single gene testing to doing panels. And we have thrown up um, lots of different variants of, of unclear um, pathogenic nature. And um, I, I still find it tough. Um, it's, um, we have the luxury at the National Hospital of having a, a, a good relationship between the clinicians seeing the patients and the genetics team and the clinical genetics. Uh, and I, I think that's still, that's still really difficult. And, and um, it's something that uh, I, I find uh, difficult to go back to people with, which is, again, it's around uncertainty of what, what one goes back with. I know um, Chris and I have spoken about this before in terms of some of the rarer FTE variants of sequestome 1, TBK1, of knowing what really is pathogenic or, or not. And there are things that, you know, we, for all the great predictive software you have in the world, if you don't have someone that's going to think about the biology of this and whether it's really pathogenic, it, it's tough. It's tough, and I, I've, I've found it harder and harder as time has gone on in thinking about, about what we do. And, and one always errs on the side of um, being cautious. And I, I, I still find that hard to know whether that's the right way to go sometimes with, with people and families. And quickly, well, please, please. really, really quickly, I think that's really important because at least some of the missense variants that are out there are wrong. They're, yeah. they're just they're sure. wrong. For any sure. disease you want to name, they're just wrong. They were done at a time maybe of candidate genes or whatever, but the biology is not there, and they're just, I mean, in retrospect, they're wrong, and I don't think there's a great way for us to know which ones yet are really wrong and which ones are, are participating, but they're not causal. Mm. They're part of the symphony, but they're not they're not where you would want them to be with respect to pathogenicity. They're, they're closer to being booze. They're closer to being variants of unknown significance. Julie, anything extra well, to I, say? I mean, I don't, I don't work clinically, but it, 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 I think I agree with Cornelia. I mean, I think people want to know what the risk is. And with common diseases where you're going to have multiple factors influencing the disease, it's, it's, it's the risk that it explains is going to be more important than actually knowing that the, that variant is is the one that is pathogenic. I mean, that's that's what if if you look testing eighty seven thousand variants for a, mm. for a score, you know that's what they're they're going to be interested in. Um, and I just want to come back to the risk element. There are many medical tests out there that are that give you risk. You know, uh, prostate cancer tests, for example. You, you know, it varies from 30 to 40 percent to you know a, a new one that's about 60 percent. You know, so so it's not, you know, it, within the medical profession, people are used to dealing with risk in different ways, and I think we need to start thinking about that for common diseases as well. I'm going to ask Rita to come and about comment about uh, assigning pathogenicity because she's looked at this specifically with regard to AD and FTD. Yeah, so I still believe I looked at it because you wanted to keep me busy, so you <laughs> told me just read all papers where persinolin 1 mutation uh, was described, and all the persinolin 2 and all the APPs, and when I did this, it was pretty clear that uh, some of these were not pathogenic and were just benign variants. Um, so what we did then was we just designed a very, um, very crude uh, algorithm, a very crude decision tree on uh, uh, the type of questions that we need to answer to say if this is a pathogenic mutation or not. Um, and I think we did this more with, with the goal of saying um, not everything that you find on persinolin 1 or persinolin 2 or APP are going to be pathogenic mutations, and you do need to assess this type of, of things when you're, when you're looking at genetic data. But 
this was, I would say, 2010. At, at the time, we were seeing uh, more and more re results from exome sequencing coming up. And this problem, of course, became a lot harder. And still today, we get lots of, of questions and people asking for our opinion on, on variants uh, on, on uh, single patients and variants that come from families. And it, it's very difficult to, to assess this, this type of thing. Um, and if we don't have informative families, if we don't have uh, segregation data, if we don't have um, functional data on, on those variants, uh, we will always say this is uncertain and we cannot say this is pathogenic. And, and of course, that is not what people want to hear and uh, it's difficult. But I do believe that we need to go, um, that we need to have a more, um, a more, not stringent, but more conservative approach mm -hmm. to what we were having before when we were just saying, well, it's procinolin 1, so it's, it's there, it's the cause of disease. Jerry. Okay, Chris, but, but good. Yeah, no, no, I would choose. Yeah, go for it, Chris. Thank you. But, yeah. but get you there for Jerry. So, so this is a, a particular point, point for me. Um, about 12 years ago, I saw a young man, I call young man now, 40, um, who'd had three children, and his brother died of early onset Alzheimer's disease, pathologically proven, and he had a pre one variant that was considered to be pathogenic at the time, and we screened him, and he was negative. He went on to develop, uh, he, he, went, he went on to have two more children, and then developed early onset Alzheimer's disease, um, for which we've not, we did not find at the time an, an alternative explanation for. Um, and when, when he did develop that, we went back and retested all the family, and those findings were absolutely real. We hadn't made a mistake or mixed up DNA. Uh, and this uh, pre variant was now considered to be a benign variant. So that was my own personal experience of um, getting it wrong and advising a family wrongly, uh, which mm -hmm. haunts me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we can't rely at all on uh, software to tell us what's pathogenic. I think what we have to have is a really robust uh, cellular assay that people uh, are using in multiple laboratories and able to, you know, give an accredited result. Um, and it's, it's um, particularly important for some of the new genes that are coming out that we really don't have an understanding of, in which there, is, there are lots of function mutations, and that's very clearly uh, likely to be pathogenic, but then there are a whole lot of point mutations which may or may not be pathogenic. And we're increasingly having to advise people. I'm seeing a family next week with a TBK1 point mutation that there's no functional data on. Um, and I've done this for TDP43 and FUS and various others as well. So I, I think that's something that as a group we have to own up to and we have to think about how we fund that uh, to do cellular assays. Uh, I have a different story in which I was, we did a, a tau uh, mutation screen in a family that were pretty confident had tau because we had the brain and it was a tauopathy. And uh, we were told by this laboratory in another country that there was absolutely no mutation. And I went back and rang them up and said, we're absolutely convinced there is a mutation. I was like, oh yes, there's, a, there's a, you know, a benign polymorphism. It turned out to be, it had already been tested functionally and shown to cause a splicing defect uh, um, uh, by Maria Spallantini. So I, I just think there has to be some um, ownership of, of the information we give. And I think it's wrong just to take a conservative approach and say, well, we found the variant, we've got no idea what it is. Which seems to be the current position of the American society. Yeah. Uh, I think, Chris, the, the difficulty is how we, how one as a community brings that all together. So one of the most frustrating things, I think, is seeing a continuous set of publications in the literature of what is said to be in the literature pathogenic mutations, which are clearly not. And, and the, the good example at the moment is TBK1, yeah. in which there are a whole set of missense mutations being published as pathogenic, which are clearly not, and it's how how does one Stop piece the, the, the literature slash find some central way of, of dealing with this? Because not everybody has the some capacity that you do. We just don't know which ones. So I, I, let's pass it to Jerry, who I'm sure, and I would agree, is that we need, it's going to say that we need more data. Oh. <laughs> uh, despite what many people say, we need more data. Uh, um, <laughs> I think there's no substitute for large databases of variants where we know what the diagnosis is and we, there, there's no substitution for that. I get nervous when there's a biologic 
assay involved. Um, <clears throat> As a biochemist, you don't trust them. Uh, Me that's neither. Right. I, I have personal experience with biochemists. Um, and I, I just bring up there was a gene FTO that was linked to obesity, and oh, yeah. um, that was thought to be the gene. You could go into the literature and find, I think, thousands of papers about why biological papers, why FTO was the gene and how it caused obesity. And then somebody figured out, well, if you delete a gene in a mouse, there's about a 30% chance it'll weigh less, no matter what the gene is. And it's, I think it's not FTO, I think it's a very confused picture, but I'm, I'm you know, it, it depends a little bit on, on, on what decision the person, the patient has to make. You know, it's, well, you've got this pathogenic variant, you better take two aspirin or, well, you should ne never have children again. Uh, you better be really sure about pathogenicity, you know, depending on the decision you make. But I'm, I'm very nervous about biologic assays, and I think there are databases being accumulated where actually people, you know, how many patients, or how, how many of these people with mutations have patients, you know, on a population level, those are being assembled, and I think there's no substitute for that. Get the Chris is gesturing at me, and yes. uh, so get it to Chris. But Katerina, you wanted to say something while the. Oh, just um, if possible to make a comment about C9. Um, uh, what happened is we don't even know the pathological cut off for the repeat number, and uh, to make Jerry nervous less, I think that. There is a technique which we develop in my lab, uh, epigenetic assessment for premutations, because premutation not uh, have any signature of uh, methylation at repeat. Uh, so it it's could be handy not only for the academics, but for the companies to supplement uh, genetic tests with at least some uh, notice that it is large enough to trigger uh, methylation response and therefore down regulation of C9, but I'm surprised, actually I was asked uh, a while ago as soon as we published the paper, oh, can we train somebody in a, a company which do a commercial test? And then it's like, because probably it's complicated, right? We all want to have a message to the patient, but uh, a company wants to make it simple, right? Like, okay, well, this is genetic test, repeat prime PCR, more than 30 repeat, you have pathological expansion, which is so wrong, because by our account, 5% of people with C9 expansion more than 30 repeats at least uh, go in a questionable category, uh, because we have, for instance, case with 70 repeat, which never developed the disease by age 90. So that's the thing that we shouldn't be lazy or nervous about the genetic supplement for some mutations, especially if it's repeat disease. I'm just going to have two more, Chris, and I'm just going to confess that Chris next and then Marilyn at the back. Quick. Marilyn holds, holds the purse string, so I'm going to give her the pleasure of the last word. Quick response to Jerry's comment. Uh, I'm more anxious about large databases because uh, almost no variant is novel. And if it appears in a database, we don't know anything about that individual, we don't know the age of the individual or their clinical phenotype, people say, okay, well, it's not pathogenic because it's out there and they general database uh, as in, in the population. Well, I was talking about databases where they actually were evaluating the patients, not just generic. Yeah, but people use those databases as, a, as, as this present, as a novel. Yeah, I think Jerry's saying those databases are not sufficient. We need to have dedicated clinical genetic databases. That's what you're saying, Jerry. Which, which there are. I mean, that, that's, that's certainly something that exists. I mean, there's a, there's a well developed, um, well certainly in, in Canada at least, uh, for all of the clinical genetic testing. Um, uh, and that, I mean, this started with copy number variation and the interpretation of copy number variation. So there is a, there is a pathway here that now is going to take hold for more for whole genome sequence uh, data, for example, that has different uh, levels of, ass of assessment for pathogenicity, but it that it's it's at the clinical level, it's at the clinical testing level. It, it's so it's based on the research findings, but it's they're very conservative with respect to what they call pathogenic. Very conservative. Coralie, lunch. lunch. <laughs> 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 